Hey everybody, it's me Cube. So I was talking about how I wanted to do a bit of a retrospective on this chapter, partly because um, I did a Twitter poll, straw poll, where I asked people what they'd like to see me do tutorials and stuff about, and a lot of people said that they'd like to hear me just kind of talk about my general way that I make comics and what I think about when I'm doing them. And I think that this chapter was a particularly interesting one to potentially talk about because of all the weird shit that happens in it in terms of visuals and whatnot. So here we go. Um, big spoilers for Sleepless Domain if you haven't read it. I'd recommend reading it first. But also, if you haven't read it, why do you even want to hear me talk about making comics? <laughs> So, this is the first page of this chapter, and obviously Tessa's having a nightmare, and, uh, I, I, I don't want to, like, I don't want to get too much into details with a lot of things, just because I don't want to stifle any, you know, fun theories or whatnot, but obviously, uh, you know, she's feeling like she's losing her powers, or she lost her powers, and, and now she's becoming... <laughs> and uh, there was a lot of different layer effects that I used here to try to get the right effect. Like this was just rendered freehand, and then I got the the boils on another layer because I wanted it. I think I was looking at burn scars or something, and I wanted it to look like there was some raised skin there, like kind of scabby. And then there's some texture here because I wanted it to look all stonish so it's I think that's just another noise texture kind of like is on the outside of this because noise is very spooky <laughs> but uh and then you see Tessa wake up and she, she's not feeling great and I know a lot of people thought that maybe uh this whole scene would be the only thing we saw of Tessa this chapter but surprise it's Tessa time whoops move back get back in there so, so then we got her waking up and then she's all you know she's not doing good Oh shit, that's right. I need to add her scab back in probably in uh, the last few pages because you would totally see it peeking out over her shirt. Shit. T -t -t by the time you go to the website, hopefully that'll be there. <laughs> I'm a great comic artist. And so you got <laughs> this shot of her merchandise. So you got these, they're like Tsum Tsums, obviously. And then you've got basically what's like a Figma and a an Nendoroid, and then a Funko Pop, and then whatever this is, and then just some other brands of figurines. And then of course Tessa has a cat, you got Tessa themed lunchbox, you got, you know, just like random ass memorabilia. Tessa, if you can be the costume of Tessa. And then all this stuff. I figured these are collections of like Magical Girl Compendium and whatnot that are related. And of course, a little jewelry set. So it's all just like different merch of hers that she thought was particularly cute. Obviously, this isn't all the merch that exists of her, but it's some of her favorites. And then a, a desk that's vaguely based on the desk that I use and I've used since I'm since like high school, <laughs> with with the drawers up top and whatnot. Obviously, backgrounds aren't aren't particularly my strong suit. And it's just checking the time, and and a stupid orange bright barrier, which like she should have just closed her blinds a little more. But I really wanted to show this little sneaky peeky, which I I know some people noticed, and I assume most people didn't. But it's just a little sneaky peeky. <laughs> and then we got the cover, which oh no, her symbol is is backwards on the cover, which I totally did on purpose and not just on accident, and it's because it's scarier if it's backwards, definitely, and, and you know, I wanted it to look like it was blasting a hole in her middle. Oh, and she's holding her jacket open, because I was thinking, like, I wanted her jacket to be, you know, pink on the outside and black on the inside, so that it, like, becomes, like, this hole effect, even though you're seeing through it, it's just, like, pure blackness, and I actually referenced pictures of myself holding a jacket open like this, but I know some people were like, where her arms and whoops <laughs> that's, that, that's the trouble of making comics but login means um this is a nautical term that you can google it's not a gurn login thing i promise yes i use adobe bridge so then we got page four and this was um heavily referenced from a sketchup model that was of a kitchen though i changed some of the details but uh I, I need to actually do that kind of thing more. Like when I know I'm going to have an environment that I'm going to reuse a lot, I need to just like make my own model of it in SketchUp or some other equivalent 3D program. Since SketchUp, you, 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 it's, you have to pay for it now and it sucks. Um, but yeah, so that's why this kitchen looks a little more decent than some of my other backgrounds might. 
and, and so you're getting the you're getting obviously the voiceover of from the TV, and everything's all cool with them, and not not going great with her. As see, it's a, a, it's a juxtaposition. It's beautiful. <laughs> I forgot it's hard to talk about your own comics like this because it feels kind of silly, but obviously, um, you know, I, I avoid showing Tessa's face in panels like this because I want it to be like a emotional distance thing. Like you're not quite sure exactly how she's feeling, but you're not, you know, we're not just showing her being like, mm -hmm. I'm not feeling very good. So here you do see her face, but you know she's not doing super great. Look, look at this cat. She's got a picture of a cat, and she got orange juice. She's eating. She's thinking about it, and of course she's thinking about how it's only been a week since her friends died, and she's thinking about it, and it makes her kind of lose her appetite, like you do. I know there was some talk about whether she's like properly anorexic during uh, the rest of this chapter. I wouldn't say so. She just has a general like decreased appetite from you know, depression as happens. And uh and so there you see her parents talking. It's one of the first times they talk in uh this chapter and obviously they are off screen. And then she she catches the bus. Or not the bus, the tram. And like this guy's got a dog. He's Team Dog. Team Dog. Oh, the very useful was it. These early ones are a little more straightforward in terms of how they're laid out. So there's not as much to talk about in terms of strict, like, comicking. Oh, these these classroom panels, it's interesting and kind of troubling because obviously classrooms are hard to draw because there's a shit ton of desks and people and you have to think about the perspective of them a lot or it looks super wrong and whatnot. Obviously you can use 3D models for that kind of thing. And I should, I should make a 3D reference of this fucking classroom. But it's also, um, in general, I try to have at least one panel per page, though it doesn't always work out, where you can see the character's feet. Like in this previous page, you have, you know, this zoomed out shot and you actually have this one in this page. And in this page, you have this zoomed out shot because it helps to establish space and whatnot. Because a lot of times as a comic artist, you can just end up drawing a bunch of bust shots over and over uh, to save time. But then you can start to lose track of like what's going on spatially. But it's hard to do with a classroom because even if you zoomed out a lot, there would be all these other desks in the way and shit. And it, it sucks. It's Classrooms are bullshit. Don't ever create a comic where a classroom is one of the settings. <laughs> and here's me just having fun drawing goofy faces because Rue is judging her for bragging about her grades. And oh, this is totally based on if you don't know the artist Corinth, uh, she's great. She draws a comic called Crisis O2 now. And she did the guest comic about the team Outrageous. And I really like how she draws, like, sometimes she'll do mouths from the side, like, like blah! And I always want to do that now. It's super cute. So we got this page. And, and she, so obviously, it's the first. Uh, it's a chance to show, uh, you know, her thinking about her relationship with Sally, which was obviously, I, I think, it was like a, again, it, it's, I don't want to talk too much about it, but she was always in this position where she was helping Sally with everything, and in a way she, like, kind of wanted to be in that position, but she also wanted to, you know, be like, oh, you have to do things for yourself, Sally, but I think secretly she really appreciated having people that relied on her like that, and that was very important to her. Uh, I could say I think. I mean, I mean, she's my character, so I guess I, I can say I know, but it feels weird. I don't know. <laughs> So here's her kind of, you know, she's made this decision based on thinking about the past, and she's like, eh, fuck it, it doesn't fucking matter, who cares, my friends are fucking dead. <laughs> oh, and there's Frisk. Or, But um, in another uh, day, they had the Frisk outfit, and now they have the Chara outfit. So, uh, it's demeaning, I, I just like cameoing. Oh god, this goddamn page. <laughs> So then we have to have this zoomed out shot where everyone ends up looking like less speak English characters because it's way easier to draw them like that than trying to draw them super detailed. Um, oh, and in a previous chapter they had normal chairs instead of bleachers, but then I realized that this setup makes much more sense and is easier to draw. So I might go edit that previous page or I might just be like, eh, fuck it, that's a different different chair somewhere. They, they ran out of bleachers, I don't know. <laughs> Uh, and 
Alright, so, oh, we got Will here. We got her boy. And me having fun drawing stupid faces again. And, yeah, Will is supposed to look like my idea of, like, a traditionally attractive anime guy, like a Bishi. Obviously, that's not a kind of character I draw a lot, so he just ends up looking like a fucking like normal ass guy. <laughs> so, whatever. Balance your diet, goddammit. That's a pretty good face. That's a pretty good face, too. This is a pretty good face, too. Hey, good job past me. Look at these stupid-ass faces. I love them. Then we got this page. So, here we establish Rue and Will. Like, obviously, Rue is a known entity at school. You know, it's people notice when you have bright green hair. So, and, and she's a bit of a troublemaker. She eats a bagel sandwich, because it's awesome. I love bagel sandwich. And he's got the generic American-style school lunch because the school sucks. And American school lunches suck. And mashed potatoes were absolutely something we had a bunch of weird conspiracy theories about when we were kids. Even though, like, a lot of the things that we thought were secretly in the mashed potatoes were things that would not be as cheap to do as the mashed potatoes. But obviously, kid conspiracy theories don't have any uh, logic to them. <laughs> And then we got this this panel. So it's like more zoomed out, kind of simplified. It's fucking having to draw this cafeteria by. Super simple panel again. Oh, he hello, Butler. And of course, this is the kind of shot that is just to, you know, let you know that some time is passing and the setting is changing by. I'm sure there's, I'm sure there's a term for this. It's like a cutaway shot. But, you know, it, it acts as a way of implying time, which can be hard in some ways, uh, sometimes to do in comics. Here, her locker's opening the wrong way. Do you see it? Butler! <laughs> do you see how, how the, the lock is on this side, but then her locker's opening on that side? Oops! Comics are hard, everybody. Don't make them. <laughs> and of course, she's thinking about those stupid tall lockers that they have at the Magical Girl School. And then we have these three randos who want her to come to karaoke. Oh my god, it's just like that part in Yuki, you know, where they want her to come to karaoke, but she can't because of her horrible voice. Oh my god, my comic really is just Yuki Yuna. Oh no! That won't make sense to a lot of people, don't worry about it. Bish! And, and so all that, that's really important here, of course, is that, you know, people are asking her, they're, they're reaching out to her, but she's kind of shutting them down. And, and you're like, oh, what else does she have to do? Guess it must be something important. But then she comes home, she lies to her parents about it. See, another another establishing cutaway shot just to kind of imply time. Then you got this this dumb shot. <laughs> Where I guess I avoided drawing the, the door and everything. Uh, and then, of course, she comes home and there's that uh, kitchen again. And her parents, and her parents are still, you can kind of see them now, but they're still off screen. And, you know, it's like an emotional distance thing or whatnot. I, I, I felt like, you know, Tessa has blocked herself off from her parents emotionally. So you always see them, but you don't see their faces. Because, like, it's like she's trying not to think about them and their emotions. Or, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's on purpose. <laughs> Yeah, and then she lies about uh, how she already ate because she's not hungry because it's a suppressed appetite and she she's feeling tired. She wants to take a nap like you do when you're sad. <laughs> and, and then she's going to take a nap and is not, not happy. And then this night, which is like Wildberry 90s night, you know, maybe, maybe someday that'll come back around, because we, we totally missed that one. And, and then you got some simple-ass buildings. And then you got these two losers again, who I imagine as twins. They're, they're twin newscasters. Um, and, and look, hospital. <laughs> Very good. Very detailed. And then so Tessa's putting her boot on. She's getting dressed. She's she's on the, the tram. And now Rue's all fucked up. Because that happens to her. <laughs> and then, of course, Tessa, she she doesn't like it. You know, like, to Rue, it's not a bad de big deal. That's just what happens. But, of course, Rue hasn't had to deal with people actually dying from the danger. 
so she doesn't she doesn't think about how Tessa thinks about it. Oh man, this is the kind of panel where it's like, oh, I should have drawn a background here, but I avoided it. But uh, it's so hard to tell when you're making comics like this how obvious it is to other people when you avoided drawing a background. Because obviously not every, every panel needs a background, but I know that every time I don't draw a background, it's like, ah, I'm taking it easy on myself when I should be trying harder. But I forget that people as readers aren't judging every page based on how much suffering you put yourself through. <laughs> But it's still a little hard to gauge where it starts to feel like you're avoiding too many backgrounds. Her shirt says slaps. I, I think because I was watching Utena and everybody slaps everybody in that. And then she has these uh, buttons. She had these in an earlier chapter. Just like this general conspiracy theory stuff. Just to remind you what her character is. <laughs> I forgot how long this chapter went before things start getting all breaking down like that. We're almost halfway through it. Because then, of course, we have fish stomachs. What's in them? This, which is a very important book where you see how like other people in the city tend to talk about things outside the city. And um, it's just one of those things that like everybody wonders about, you know, but you're never quite sure. But, you know, some people think it's more important than others. Because what you're going to do about it, can't do shit about it, like Tessa says. And Tessa's eating a salad, so she she's managing. And Rue, I think she had another bagel sandwich because she's my girl. And he drink choco milk. And so in this page, you see that Tessa, you know, said something um, more depressing than she realized because she really wasn't trying to be a big downer about it. But you know, that's just kind of the headspace she's in. And like she says, it's like guessing about the afterlife or something, which some people still consider, you know, worthwhile to talk about and do. But from her perspective, it's like, who fucking cares? It, it doesn't matter. They're dead. <laughs> and of course, Rue assumes that the government knows. And it's like a lot of people, some people think that Rue, her conspiracies are like unreasonable somehow, but they're, they tend to be pretty on point. Like they're not that crazy. I, I mean, they, they might or might not be true, but it, it's, she's not a, like a, the most irrational person. Oh, and she's got she's got this like flan style pudding, which I guess is because I watch too much anime because, you know, that's how like all most pudding is in Japan. You, you just call the flan style, you call it pudding. But th things still seem like they're going pretty OK. You know, she's having she, they're having fun. They're having talks. But, oh wait, oh yeah, that's right, this is the page that ended up being visually confusing for people, because you don't see Tessa in this panel or this panel, so people were like, where'd she go? But my, my intention when I was drawing it is just that, God, it's just that Tessa is, you know, like, further in the foreground than the camera, and it makes sense that you wouldn't actually be able to just place a camera there and see all this without seeing Tessa, like, you know, here... And then big giant shadow Tessa here, theoretically. Um, so I thought I could get away with cheating it to show like the aspects I wanted to see. And I wanted Tessa to not be in these panels because she's like kind of cut herself off from the conversation. But it ended up making people think that Tessa had physically left, which, oops. <laughs> so something to, you know, it's a learning process. Then, of course, you have... Uh, you know, she she's she's just not she's zoned out. She's <laughs> disassociating, and, and then so she's sleeping. And then oh hey, it's our girl. It's the woman in white. It's it's fun to draw her. I enjoy drawing her. And then this this effect was hard to figure out exactly how to do. Like the like she's being um, rejected in some way, but I think I got it across visually. Hopefully. And there's a lot of craziness with the panels here, not the panels, the layers, in order to get the right effects. Because you got like the noise layer and then this thing, which has an outer glow on it. And I think I also did a blur effect on it to kind of soften it a bit. And then you got the flats and, and the zits and the BG inks and the shades. And what was the inks? Turn those on. And, and so there's a lot of weird layering to try to get the right effect, which on this page, too, also has. I was very proud of how I drew this. I, I feel like it 
it shows the right idea. <laughs> and of course, it, this is a bummer zone. And now this is supposed to be telling you that there's been a time skip, which I know didn't read quite to everybody. Oops. But, um, you know, because they're talking about the same thing, but they're saying that it's been a couple weeks now. So it has been uh, between, you know, this scene, or at least the previous scene with Rue, and this, it's been a couple weeks. So who knows what HP and Undine have been up to. Look at them, these little babies. This is me being mean, but also the world being mean, because in my mind, they just didn't really have very many good pictures of Undine that didn't involve the other girls, so they just used one of those. And then, of course, here's HP just being all casual, like, hello, cameraman, I, I guess you want pictures of me, because I'm so cool. And then we got more panels where I avoid showing her dad's face, so you can see that he has glasses, which is a very important reveal. And here's some, like, bullshit uh, Sumie-style thing. Just, like, generic art that you would buy at a thrift store to make your home feel less empty. She's got a good old Western-style breakfast. Oh, her dad's got grits. Because grits are delicious, and I love them. And I won't accept anything bad about them. And then <laughs> come back, and I... <laughs> I know this is stupid. But I thought it would be funny if she just had a big bandage over her afro. But I know. <laughs> Allow me this small pleasure for myself. And then uh, he had this kid with this very important backpack. And the little cracks begin here. Oh, and also during this chapter, I've been moving a Will and Rue's color slightly closer to each other. So in the previous scene where they were talking at the talking here, his shirt is already becoming slightly more cyan, and her sh shirt is also a little uh, more towards blue than it would normally be. And so in this scene, their shirts are almost already the same color because they're getting along so well. It's, it's, it's symbolic, you see, of, of, of things. S see? It's uh, art. It's amazing. And then here we have... <laughs> I do these kinds of shots sometimes where it's like from above, but everyone's also chibi because it's so hard to do that perspective if everyone's not chibi. And it, and, it, and it probably ends up being a little goofy, but I'm always learning. <laughs> and then, so while you might have missed the cracks in the last page, obviously you're not going to miss them in this page. And Rue is being super cool. You know, she still wants to support Tessa acting, asking Will out. But Tessa's just shutting herself off. She's she's breaking up with herself. What? What am I saying? She <laughs> Obviously here it's like coming down towards her face because she's like hiding her actual feelings. Oh, and Tessa's, um, obviously her bang swoop has been weakening over this chapter to show that she's become more unhappy. So she can't make it do the ridiculous aerial thing anymore because that was the true source of her power. Yeah, and see, here we show that Rue is actually pretty reasonable about her conspiracies, because the idea that people have secret tunnels that go in and out, that's too much for her. She doesn't buy that shit. Stupid. And then you got pizza. Very important pizza. I made, tried to make it look nice and greasy. And then you got the little jalapeno that always comes with your Papa John's or whatnot. And then obviously the panels are get, getting even more fucked up. And just to the point where it's like, now this is a transition between things that, like, nothing even goes here. It's all just lost time and everything kind of merging together in her mind and none of the details really matter. And we got her old rotary phone with the, with the Roman numerals on it because they love to use Roman numerals in the city. And and she's she's doing she's doing what she's supposed to. She is calling Undine, but she'd actually prefer not to talk to Undine because oh, because because it feels bad. Oh, her her shirt says Peach on it. It's a very generic shirt. <laughs> and oh God, her window's the wrong color. I'll fix that. Ah, this is just gonna be me finding a bunch of errors that I need to fix. But yeah, this is you know like a lot of times you don't. You just don't want to deal with it. <laughs> so she doesn't want to deal with it. 
Oh, and by the way, the, the doing all the cracks was an interesting process because I would generally thumbnail the pages with the general idea that there would be all those cracks, but I wouldn't do all the details or anything. So you start out with this generic uh, page where I have the inner stroke on the layer that I make the borders on. So normally what I do is do this, you know, kind of break them up, make some make some panel borders based on the thumbnails, and then for the cracks I would just end up being like. It's a no, and it's, no, it's unbalanced. And since you know there's the inner stroke on the layer, it's making them automatically, and and I would just futz with it until it looked right and seemed both balanced, but gave the right impression for what I wanted to to do. But it was a mess. And then of course we got this page with me. I mean Miss Cable. Obviously I don't want to give myself too big of a role in my own comic, but here I'm just being a figure that to, you know, that would like notice a very obvious thing about how Tess is not doing great. And it's mostly about giving Rue a chance to establish that she has noticed that, you know, Tessa isn't doing great, but she's trying to be respectful and give her space. And uh, and, and she has a very important shirt, which, which is a little snack, a little snack question mark. So what? But she, you know, like Tessa thinks that she's like hiding all of her feelings and how bad she's doing from everybody. But this is showing like at least, you know, Rue and her teachers are aware of she's not doing great. This is another panel where I'm like, ah, I should have drawn a background back there, you lazy asshole. But you know where she is in space, and it's fine. It's fine, me. It's fine! And then you got... Blah, 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 blah. See, now this acts as a kind of establishing panel instead of a... Or, I mean, a, a time skip instead of the cutaway that I did in the earlier things. And, and now her, her locker closes in the right direction because I realized what I'd done and the crimes that I had committed. And so, of course, this is Tessa, you know, pretending that she can't hang out again, but now it's, it's with her Rue friend, who's a better friend. And and so she's, you know, she's wondering if Tessa is always avoiding her because of, you know, something Rue did, or because Rue's annoying. But then Tessa asks, are you really a magical girl? This this panel is kind of funny because it looks like she's like got her face like just touching her locker. It's I didn't mean for her to be that close, but <laughs> what you gonna do? And and Rue is understandably like, what the fuck are you talking about? But in Tessa's mind, it's like she doesn't she really doesn't understand why someone would act this casually about getting injured that much. And so I. I think it's like part, I would say that she partly believes that it's possible and partly just wants to, you know, push Rue away and say something mean. Like if she really made herself think about it, she'd probably realize it doesn't make any sense. But in her mind, it's just like, fucking shut up. It's you probably aren't even a magical girl. I don't care. If it's, nah. and, and so of course Rue's like, the fuck? <laughs> And uh, so Tessa, you know, kind of lays out her bullshit reasoning that she's been thinking of. And Rue's just like, it's dumb. And see, and you don't see many people around them during this, because partly because it would be weird uh, to have it be too crowded while they're having this conversation. And also, it's easier to draw. But, you know, then, then you have this panel showing, it's like, there are other people noticing this. And Rue's mad at her, and, and says this is being a jerk, because sad, and, and and all this. And there's a lot of white space, because everything's all broken. And everything continues to be all broken on this page, where you see the that she's riding the tram. And again, we are not seeing Tessa's face again here, because she's, she's all disconnected and stuff. To our guardians! And that, and... Then we get this is it this statue. So what's up with that? It's mysterious. This shot should probably have had some more detail in it. God, I I, sh I shouldn't make these just nitpicking my own comic, should I? Uh, oops. But you can see the the dome there that we see every once in a while, just to remind you that it exists. And then you see the, the graveyard where we haven't checked in in a while with these, but now they've all got these different flowers. I didn't put names on here. I promise they do have names, though. It's it's a conservation of detail thing. It's not that these are all unnamed graves, 
and, and just like different flowers. And this one is a, oh God, what is that flower called? A zinnia, a green zinnia. And this one is a black eyed Susan. And this one is an amaryllis. And I did try to look up flower meanings and pick something that was appropriate for each of them. And so I, I promise I thought about it. But yeah, those are doing well at least. So that's good. And you notice that the cracks have gone away. The cracks have kind of uh, settled down a bit. Because she's here where she doesn't have to hide anything from anyone. And she's just kind of like embracing her own actual feelings in this moment. And, and so you see her, she's leaving and she's just going over here to kind of dissociate for a while. I, I feel like not a whole lot of people come here just because it's such a bummer. Every once in a while you probably have like high school field trips where, you know, it's like a, we need to come here because it's an important part of our culture and all that stuff. And then everybody hates it and complains. But mostly it's a pretty quiet place where she can just, you know, fuck off mentally for a while. Oh, this was the page that I lost because of like Photoshop crashed mid save and then like the file was corrupted and even the recovery didn't work and it was a nightmare. It was a nightmare. And then we finally get an anemone, anemone, anemone. And here you have this kind of, this is a very <laughs> manga -ish shot, a very shoujo manga shot where it's the same panel but you're seeing her both zoomed out and zoomed in. Uh, Oh, and I guess her, her umbrella doesn't make a lot of sense because it couldn't fold up with the way it's constructed. It doesn't it doesn't have those wire thingies, um, the supports. So I guess it's it's not very practical. But I just wanted to give her a cute umbrella that matched her flower, her anemone flower. And and so she has her sketchbook because you know she does actually make all the art that she does in the interstitials. So she's she's a pretty good artist, and she got the goops. And it's not like perfectly accurate because you know like she gave her white teeth and stuff. So this is just her you know drawing it as best she can from memory, and it's pretty close. And she do a good job. She's doing her best, damn it. Just even though she's a little grumpy boy boy. And of course, Tessa legitimately doesn't know what she's talking about, and she's like, hmm, she's trying to figure out something. Who knows? Uh, see, this is a page where I should have drawn more backgrounds than I did. This is probably the worst offender of this chapter, but it, it also just felt kind of appropriate to, like, if you... Cause here it'd be like there'd be like a park, and then like further back there'd be all the like other buildings past the park. And do we really need that? I, I don't know, man. <laughs> and so she's like, very well, whatever. And so she just wants to make sure that she still has this effect, which you know has happened a couple other times, but not as the comic hasn't called as much direct attention to it. So it's like, hmm, what's up with that? Or whatnot. I know what's up with that. Ha ha ha. This is a kind of hard angle to draw faces from, but I think it looks okay. And then Tessa, being a reasonable person, is like, so what the fuck's all this about? And see, this is a better zoomed out shot. That, that's better, Mary. And, and, and see, here's, I need to get better at like doing this kind of like implication of buildings without it feeling like... But, but that's another thing where you have to figure out a balance, because it's like, once you put buildings there, if they're just cubes, they look like shit, but then, like, you have to commit yourself to drawing in all the details, or it's, you, you it's, uh, it's hard, the comics are hard. So here it's just like, fuck it, sky. <laughs> And here, Anemone is actually being very honest. She's just l literally saying, she's answering the question, even though she knows it's not going to go well. Because that's the kind of girl she is. And of course, Tessa's upset because what, what the fuck's all that about? You wouldn't expect that. There's that background. Well, not a whole lot else to say about that. She She's kind of, you know, like the way that this is shaded is kind of rim lit. She's exiting the comic go back to her fourth wall zone. I have a purring kitten in my lap. It's extremely good. Uh, this panel was an interesting stylistic thing to figure out. So here, this panel is, kind of, looks kind of goofy. But of course, uh, 
you know, Tessa's not just gonna let her have her dramatic anime walk off, which is what an enemy wanted. She want she wanted to have her dramatic anime walk off, like where she says the weird thing and then leaves. But Tessa's like, no, I'm not just gonna let you walk away because <laughs> you said a bunch of weird shit. And, and so an enemy pulls her trump card to make her go into blue screen mode by telling her exactly what the statue is of, which clearly she can't can't do that. And, and here I think is a decent shot where you can see, you know, everything that's going on behind and whatnot. And then, because like in, in, for these buildings, I just put, these are just flats with shades on them. Like if I turn off the shading layer, see, it, it's just flat colors, which I like to do sometimes because I have the inks layer in front and then I have the BG inks layer, which I usually will put a the highlight layer between the front BG inks and the BG inks so that I can um, create some kind of atmospheric lighting and push the BG inks back so they don't clutter up the panel. And so this is like the next stage of how I would fake atmospheric lighting is just to have like flats and shadows with no inks back there. Um, and of course this is like, oh, the fuck? <laughs> oh, I'm sorry if these are super rambly. If I do more of these I'll probably figure out a better system to not ramble so much. And then she's back on the tram. You know, a couple other sleepy people minding their own business. What is wait. Okay, never mind, I did that just now. <laughs> yeah. Oh look this is like a horrible version of like Starry Night or something. It's just bullshit. <laughs> bullshit to make it to put something there. And then of course she comes home. And I realized oh the I did the locker thing again. She was going... The reason that this is kind of weird in terms of where she's placed and where her hand is is because I drew the doorknob over here, but then I remembered in that panel way earlier in the chapter the doorknob should be on this side, and then I was like, ah, fuck. <laughs> so I just erased the doorknob, and so now it's just kind of strange. So, sometimes you gotta wing it. <laughs> and of course she hears her parents talking about uh, the fact that they know she's going to the graveyard. Mr. Marita is... You know, that's Gwen's dad because uh, her last name is Marita. But it's okay if you don't remember that. I figure from context clues you can kind of, you know, just guess it's an adult they know or whatnot. And of course, they're they're not sure what to do about it. They're trying to be good parents, but they also, you know, they just don't know how to deal with the situation, which is understandable. And then, so but Tessa, you know, she doesn't want to deal with this either. <laughs> I mean, no, they want to deal with it, they just don't know how. how. Tessa just doesn't want to deal with it. So, so she comes in and closes the door more loudly so that she can convince them that she just got home and so she doesn't have to deal with it. But but she's got the cracks back, she's got the cracks back because she's full of shit. And then we have this panel, which is supposed to be a kind of wink-wink at the Hanged Man tarot card, which I guess is a bit hammy. But I, I tried not to make it too on the nose, but obviously it's okay if you don't notice it either way, because it's just kind of this uncomfortable upside down panel where she's laying there. And then you see the conversation they had where she was just bullshitting through all of it, and you don't get to see any of their faces, because it's just this strange... Like, all of these, and I'm, I'm really glad that it seemed to work for a lot of people, you know, because the, the cracked panels are trying to create this feeling that you have where you're, you're just incredibly, like, depressed or stressed out, and you kind of start to lose your sense of time, and, like, you'll try to remember a conversation you had, and it's all weird and fuzzy because you were, your brain was just all over the place, and, and so that's what this is kind of trying to show, obviously. Um, and I'm re I, I was really glad to hear that a lot of people totally got got it. And then you got her window, which obviously an enemy talked about. And then it's 10 o'clock, all magical girls should be transformed and all civilians should be inside. Boop, boop, boop. And then here's it's just like a little bit of a uh, gradient to try to show that there's light coming in. And it's it's a kind of light where you can't quite tell if it's pink or purple because of, cause of goops and, and ma magical girl Tessa you see. It's it's both pink and purple. It's oh oh, but here there's no cracks, but there it is. These panels are you know um, off kilter because the weird shit's going on. 
so I didn't want to have a basic rectangular panels, um, which I normally do for all the regular daytime dialogue scenes. And so she starts to remember, because this part wasn't, you know, as close to her, to Anemone talking about the thing that she's not supposed to be able, able to remember. And so that part's able to come back. And I, I know some people took this as, like, she only opened the window because she remembered... She she only remembered these parts of the conversation and didn't remember the fact that an enemy told her not to open it. But I think she remembered it all. It's just that she wants to prove to herself that an enemy was just a crazy person. So it, she she totally remembers an enemy saying, you know, it's, she's outside your window, don't open your blinds. And she's like, that's stupid. I'm going to prove to myself that it's not a thing. And this was... <laughs> um, I, I realized as I was drawing these panels that the blinds should have always had those um, if you look at actual window blinds there's like those threads between them and you really should be able to see that but I guess comic conservation of detail you'll forgive me right? you'll forgive me right? <laughs> and uh oh and this is the kind of page I tend to try to avoid most of the time in my comic because obviously it's a web comic and you're only getting a page every few days so I don't like to do this kind of you know this page is something about to happen and tune in next week to see the thing actually happen but this this scene just needed a little more room to breathe so uh, I wasn't able to avoid it this time but I do try to avoid it as much as possible I try to make each page as satisfying as I can And then, of course, you got the reveal. And I was a little proud of myself here, because I know there was different theories about whether it would be, you know, like she'd just see a spooky goop's face outside her window, or whether there would just be nothing there, and you're just like, oh, where is she? But it's, it's a little different than either of those. So, haha, gotcha, I win. <laughs> and, of course, this is based on the same font that I have goops talk in, which is a font called Levi Brush, Levy Brush. And... It has a bit of an outer glow, but like a dark outer glow on it to make it look a little less like it's just a computer font. And then I added some things like this to make it look like, uh, you know, it's actually dripping something. And, and then this is like a very, this is a very anime panel where, you know, it's like you see the tear and then like it, it fills in like what the person crying this stupid anime thing and I, and I was also referencing anime for how to render the tears because I, I, I in a lot of my old comics I make the tears way too blue and it looks super wrong but I, I like this way that a lot of anime does tears where the outline of it is white and then the inside of it is just kind of like a gray or bluish gray and then you have some highlights every once in a while it works very well while being simple and still feeling correct and of course, this is the first time that Tess has actually cried in this chapter because fuck, <laughs> it's because it's a lot. Everything's a lot, and and so she's finally just letting herself letting herself make a cry. Uh, hang in there, Tessa. <laughs> and then of course we got to have our interstitial with anemone, anemone, anemone. And uh, but she doesn't have any interest interesting world building information for us today. She's just making excuses. This fucking doesn't she know that that's rude to do? Wait, her sketchbook looks too big there compared to her. Shit! Why do I even? Oh yeah, that's right. I wanted to look at. Look, you need to be able to see her scab there. Dang it! I will fix that as soon as I stop recording this. Stupid! How did I forget that it's important thematically to this chapter? I'm an idiot. <laughs> I'll add that in. I promise. It's gonna be like a little whoop, whoop, but it's it's important that it's there. And why did I miss an opportunity to remind you that it's there? I'm so dumb. I'm a fool. And she, look, you need to put your trash out more in enemy. But, you know, she doesn't like going outside and dealing with people, so she also avoids taking her trash out. But she's, she's not doing super great. But, you know, no one's doing super great this chapter, are they? Ah, oh, that was very rambly, wasn't it? But I hope... I, I'm really, I've honestly really been very happy with people's response to this chapter because I was, I was honestly worried that people were going to find it boring because it's mostly about, you know, Tessa, who we haven't spent as much time with and nobody gets to be a magical girl except, I guess, an enemy, an enemy during this chapter. 
and uh, it's just more kind of general, you know, like state of being stuff. And I guess it's kind of more than anything, it's just a portrayal of good old depression and how you can go into a spiral over, you know, all kinds of little things. And I'm happy to hear that it resonated with some people, uh, because obviously a lot of that stuff is writing from the heart, as it were. But I guess I don't have a whole lot else to say about it. I thought I'd have more, like, technical things to say, but it's kind of hard to figure out what to talk about when I'm just looking at it like this. Oh, I use some actual blurring sometimes. I try not to do it too much, because I feel like it's easy for it to look too doofy if you have too much blur. But, um, see, like, this is blurred a bit to push it in the background. And I think it's up on a slightly um, reduced opacity, which makes it feel a little like an anime, I think, because I make stupid wannabe anime comics. <laughs> uh, I guess that's all I have to say about this chapter. If you found this interesting, I'm totally down for doing more. And if there's any other like specific part of the process of me making pages, um, I'd totally be down for talking about that. It's just hard to, you know, when someone's like, I want to know how you make comics, that's, you know, it, it's a very long process that has a lot of steps to it. Oh, but I don't script out chapters ahead of time. I make them as I go. Like, I, I know, I knew pretty much what I wanted to happen this chapter and some of the specific beats, but it wasn't written down anywhere. So I wanted to show this is, like, this is what the thumbnails for these pages look like. Oh, wait. Turn the schedule off. It's just like this mess of general ideas. And, and then you get like to the sketch. And even that's not very... Oh yeah, because by the time I do the sketch, I've already done the panels. So that would look like that. Oh, and, oh, and I've done the bubbles. I don't, I don't bother drawing things that are b behind the bubbles and whatnot. You gotta you gotta take care of yourself, comic artist. Don't draw behind the bubbles. But that's that's about it. Th thank you for listening to me ramble about my own comic. <laughs> Bye.